All right. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, thank you, Jill Swartz, for organizing this webinar. Jill represents PRP Science. Um, and we'll learn a bit about some of the products that, uh, that they make available to us. We are recording the webinar, so we'll have a link for any of you who um, aren't able to stay for the entire, entire thing. We have quite a few people who've registered tonight, uh, so I'm just going to wait another minute or so, let everybody show up. I do want to point out that there are three handouts. You'll see them in your GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see PRP Science uh, catalog. The science of PRP, which is a, a bit of a buying guide, if you will, just talking about some of the d different elements of um, Play the Rich Plasma and why they're important. Almost a summation of the important points of this evening. And then, of course, there's an order form so you can have the contact information for PRP Science, who is the distributor. Okay, so let's go ahead and get going. So this is PRP 101, the application, the science, the controversy. I, I am Dr. Elizabeth Roy, and again, thank you very much for joining me. I feel that uh, it's really important at this particular point in the PRP game to actually educate about platelet-rich plasma itself. So, so we're all getting very excited about PRP, and now we've come to a bit of a crossroad, and we have to figure out what's the best PRP and why, and uh, set some standards. So that's what tonight is all about. There is a questions section also. Feel free to submit questions, and uh, we're going to try to keep this webinar to 45 minutes. Um, we'll then answer, I will answer questions at the end. And any questions that I don't get to, what I'll do is um, I'll answer them via a follow-up email. So that will be hopefully satisfies everybody's needs. All right, so who's Studio PRP? Studio PRP is, is a physician-owned training, research, and marketing company. Uh, I, I own and found, founded Studio PRP. I've been working for the last six years to help physicians bring PRP services to their patients. And our mission really is to build a collaboration of providers uh, so that we can advance this regenerative technology. And, and, and I think that there's lots of future for us here. We want to use the current scientific and clinical data to drive best practices and to really help us with protocols so that we get the best patient outcome. That's, that's why we're here and that's why we're, we're educating. Just a brief bit about my journey. 2010, I started using platelet-rich plasma for aesthetics. I, I went and, and did some uh, training for the vampire facelift, vampire facial. Dr. Runnels has done a great job introducing platelet-rich plasma to many of us. In 2011, I added sexual medicine and urinary incontinence procedures known as the O-Shot and the Priapus Shot. Uh, I've also spent some time with Dr. Bauman and learned about platelet-rich plasma for hair regrowth. And then, of course, I have uh, done some joint injections as well. In 2011, I also started a formal physician training program, and uh, that's been a lot of fun and a lot of learning. I've completed the stem cell fellowship and, and additional stem cell training. And I decided that, um, uh, or realized really, that a lot of the physicians needed help with marketing and, uh, and uh, really understanding how to evolve with Play the Rich Plasma, so Studio PRP was created. So we call this PRP 101, just going to take you right back to the, the basics in the beginning. PRP has been used since 1950, originally to help with bone grafts. Large volumes of blood were necessary, so it was really difficult. Different from today, where we have centrifuges that we can use in our office. Once that happened, the um, uh, dentists really embraced platelet-rich plasma, and they have published many, many studies with Play the Rich Plasma, the effectiveness, and have been using it for many years. In 1987, PRP was um, used in open heart surgery, as you can see there, and a study was published. So that really kicked things off. Um, that study showed that the, the benefits to the patient were not only additional clotting, but also they required much less pain medications, um, they healed more quickly, they needed less transfusions, and really it changed the game for recovery for those patients. 
There were other early studies that showed some uh, significant efficacy for non-healing wounds, and, and really you could take a non-healing wound and bring it to full um, uh, resolution in 10 weeks. That's pretty amazing. So as you can imagine, these studies helped platelet-rich plasma really explode across many specialties. And it's one of the most progressive, exciting uh, procedures that we're introducing right now to office-based medicine. Consumers are very excited about platelet-rich plasma. It certainly is gaining popularity, um, not only to an alternative to surgery in the orthopedic specialty, uh, but, but also, again, in aesthetics and sexual medicine and hair regrowth. Um, all kinds of exciting things there. There's countless clinical studies that are, are showing the effectiveness of these procedures, and we have many more in the works. So we know platelet-rich plasma uh, is, uh, participates and is successful in tissue regeneration. A lot of thought leaders um, introducing different standards and calling for different standards so that we can further understand appropriate application. So let's talk about the application. Again, facial rejuvenation, hair regrowth, you can see that um, um, some of these areas have exploded. We've had some significant interest by some leading urologists, several, just a, a couple of my good friends, Dr. Joseph Bano and Dr. Paul Perito, are very excited about platelet-rich plasma and what it's doing for their practices, even uh, adjunctive to surgeries. So it's not necessarily in place of, in some cases, it's adjunctive to. So it makes what they're doing well even better and uh, we're seeing improvements in erectile function. Certainly Peyronie's disease is an exciting new frontier. Uh, there have been very, very little effective and safe treatments for Peyronie's and play the rich plasma is excellent. Uh, pelvic pain even for men and women and then of course for women who have vaginal pain and pelvic pain. There was a small study, study uh, published recently by Dr. Goldstein looking at the effectiveness of platelet-rich plasma, the O-shot in particular for lichen sclerosis. We're using it for interstitial cystitis. So that's the urogynecology or urology and gynecology space. Lots of excitement. Plastic surgery, um, hair restoration, pain medicine. You can see all the various uses. Rosacea, for instance, being a problem that many, many people have and play the rich plasma works very, very well to calm the inflammation, help to uh, resolve the problem and uh, improve the quality of the skin. So that's exciting. Surgical specialties have embraced platelet-rich plasma. Sports medicine, you know, we're hearing about it in the news. Neurosurgery, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a cardiovascular surgeon and he actually used PRP um, decades ago in his surgeries. He got the idea from orthopedic surgeon partners of his and, um, and he said that it really changed the game for him as far as complications and infections. So lots of surgical applications. So today I, I want to spend most of our time on the science and uh, again, right to the basics. So what is plasma? Holds the uh, blood cells in a liquid suspension. About 55% of the total volume is plasma. Three types of cells, oversimplifying obviously, red cells, white cells, and platelets. The platelets facilitate coagulation, healing, and repair. So platelets are cytoplasmic fragments of megakaryocytes, which are, are, as you remember, formed in the bone marrow. They circulate in the blood. And what is really important about these platelets is they contain alpha granules. And it's the alpha granules that contain growth factors and biologic proteins. And that's where our action is. So we have to really think about how many platelets can we get to the area? And can we actually cause a degranulation? That's a p an important piece of this as well, to um, have growth factors and biologic proteins spill into the treatment area. So there's a few different uh, areas in the cascade or the process that need to be considered. So platelet-rich plasma by definition is defined by Marx, and, and this is a, a paper that was written quite a while ago, 2001. Um, most major platelet-rich plasma papers or papers about platelet-rich plasma will reference Marx's definition, and that is 
approximately 1 million platelets per microliter in 5 milliliters of plasma. And that takes us on average to four to six times the baseline concentration. So there's many systems out there right now that, that are, they claim to yield platelet-rich plasma. And in fact, quite frequently, there is an increase above baseline in platelets, but it falls short of the true definition scientifically accepted definition to date, which is four to six times the number of, base, of uh, platelets in the, uh, uh, the plasma itself. So I like this expanded definition of platelet-rich plasma because it points out a few primary things, and, and that is it's a matrix graph. It is autologous, which means from the patient back to the patient. And it's a graph that is incorporating growth factors and undifferentiated cells in a cellular matrix. What's really key here is that this works. Um, the design depends on the receptor site and the tissue of regeneration. And, and what that means is wherever you put platelet-rich plasma, it's going to interact with the receptor sites at the location of injection. So if you're putting it in a knee, you're going to stimulate chondrocytes, you're going to stimulate the uh, stem cells that are present, and as you'll see in a few minutes, if you have the right concentration of platelets and the right concentration of growth factors, you'll actually recruit stem cells to the area. So once platelets are activated, as I said, that's called degranulation, they empty their contents, and you can see uh, there are lots of good things in the PRP, we get a platelet gel that forms once it's activated. And it can be activated in a few different ways. It can be activated just simply by coming in contact with, with a, a tissue, a wounded tissue, for instance, or an inflamed tissue. You can use thrombin, you can use calcium. Um, out here in practice, we typically will use calcium chloride. Uh, I do like to activate. And um, you have here a chart of growth factors. So you can see that there's no mystery to how platelet-rich plasma really works. And that's, that's interesting to me because so many physicians have a sense that this is a trend or, oh, that PRP doesn't work. Well, you know, it does. This is a very important part of, of the, the whole healing process, the healing cascade that we experience. And we know very well what these growth factors are and we know what they do. You can see the biological actions on the right side there. We have a mitogenic effect on mesenchymal stem cells. You know, we have stimulation of undifferentiated stem cells for cell proliferation. We, we know that there's a, uh, an increase in angiogenesis and vessel permeability with the VEGF growth factors. So as you go through this, this table and notice what these growth factors actually do, it's pretty easy to take the leap and think about having a liquid, a fluid, that you can point and direct to wherever it is you're trying to regenerate or repair. And that's what I think is exciting about the use of platelet-rich plasma. Um, you know, we're in the process of studying how effective it is, and we're in the process of understanding that there are differences in the platelet-rich plasma that, that we create. And so we're just fine-tuning. And uh, that's what I, I hope for you to take away from this here, um, that this is, this is not a mystery by any means. We know the biological actions. And these growth factors act as chemical messengers, and they exert a bioregulatory action. Cytokines participate in regeneration and degen de downregulation rather of degenerative inflammation, and that's another important thing. You know, we want to repair and regenerate the tissue. We also want to resolve inflammation. Um, when you're using this in, in joints, you don't want inflammation. When we're trying to regrow hair, we certainly don't want inflammation. So we have to know what's in our platelet-rich plasma so that we are collecting as much anti-inflammatory potential as well as regenerative potential, and we are trying to discard pro-inflammatory cells. Um, certainly we know that, that platelet-rich plasma contains uh, or has rather antibacterial and antifungal properties and so on and so forth. We can create new vascular tissue, which is otherwise called angiogenesis. So when degranulation occurs, um, this, 
these active proteins are secreted, they bind to the receptors on the target cells, um, and we have a proliferation that occurs. There is an activation of an intracellular protein signal, and we get gene expression. So again, you know, no mystery as to how this works. And I've referenced many of these articles so that you can see, you know, there's, there's a lot of science here, and it's really very, very exciting once you delve into it. We know that active secretion of the growth factors begins within 10 minutes of activation, so it's very important to understand that. Um, and, and we know that more than 95% uh, of the growth factors are secreted within an hour. So it's, a, it's like an explosion of healing potential and regenerative potential into the treatment area. Now, uh, Rugetti and, and his group have studied the relationship between the concentration of plasma, or platelets rather, in the, in the gel, and the functional activity of the endothelial cells. And so what they found is we have a proliferation of endothelial cells and, and an invasion that happens um, with a peak proliferation at 1.25 um, uh, million, essentially, micro uh, liters for that's star concentration. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm tripping myself up here. So basically, between 1.25 million and 1.5 million cells per microliter is where you get your maximum angiogenesis. So this also speaks to Marx's definition of what platelet-rich plasma is. So what's the level of of concentration that's necessary to get an angiogenesis or to get a, a stem cell migration. Okay, and there's a lot of thought now in the literature. We're seeing the orthopedics surgeons talk about this in their in their uh, conference most recently that perhaps this platelet count and and ultimately growth growth factor concentration is really what this is all about. Now, I, I think there's a bit more to it, and, and we're, we're certainly going to see um, that as we move through some of these studies and some of this literature. Uh, but, but this is really important when you think about the concentration. So understand what you're trying to achieve here. We're trying to achieve an angiogenesis, a regeneration of tissue, and a recruitment of stem cells. So as I said before, this is just a different way of saying it. Um, I'm referencing another paper here that Rugetti participated in, which is identifying an optimal concentration for angiogenesis. And you can see there's also a critical point where too much shows a regression of benefit. So anything, any PRP less than 1.5 million platelets um, uh, and more than 3 million platelets will show less angiogenic potential. So it can, there's a sweet spot. There really is a sweet spot. There can be too super concentrated of a platelet-rich plasma, interestingly enough. Uh, just citing a couple of different studies here as well, where we are showing that the right platelet-rich plasma um, can stimulate an anabolic effect, which is, which is great for regeneration. We can harness the monocytes for an anti-inflammatory effect. And then certainly the bioactive protein fibrinogen acts as a scaffolding, which is important. And, and so we need a robust PRP in order to, uh, to really have that occur. Neutrophil depleted PRP, um, with monocyte enriched basically is what that means. Neutrophil depleted, monocyte enriched, pure PRP has been shown um, uh, to, to really have a maximum anabolic effect on the ACL repair. And this is a pretty well-known chart now. This was published in 2002 that shows the exponential increase in cell proliferation as a result of platelet concentration. So again, you know, we know that four to six times baseline is referred to as the sweet spot, and this speaks to that as well. You have five times baseline is increasing the population by 227%. So we might say, well, gee, you know, according to this chart, 10 times baseline does even more, uh, uh, contributes even more to proliferation. But remember, we were just talking about angiogenesis, and so that supra concentration would really be an inhibitory uh, effect on the on the angiogenesis. So again, this sweet spot is is really important. It's where everything seems to align. 
and uh, we get this maximum effect. This is, I just think, a really cool picture showing an electron microscopy uh, that really shows mesenchymal stem cells adhering to the fibrin matrix, if you will, or the scaffolding. Uh, there's a lot of regenerative activity going on right there. and We have uh, uh, some great adhesion, and this was just published in 2014. Um, so again, wherever you put this tissue, this platelet-rich plasma, um, you're going to get stimulation of unipotent stem cells. And hopefully, if you have the right concentration, you'll get a recruitment of stem cells to the area. This is going to um, uh, foster the regenerative effect that you're looking for. We must also have a degranulation of the alpha granules, because imagine we've got all of this uh, these platelets in the area, we've got our perfect concentration, you know, we're ready to go, and then there's no degranulation. If we don't have degranulation, then we don't have growth factors spilling into the area. And really very interesting, in June 2015, there was a paper published that showed the influence of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on this degranulation. They actually inhibit degranulation. So we want to make sure that we choose our patient appropriately and we prepare our patient appropriately um, for best results. If, if they are uh, taking NSAIDs and, and come in on NSAIDs and we harvest their plasma, it doesn't matter what equipment we're using. If we're inhibiting a degranulation, then we certainly are going to inhibit our regenerative response. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change our outcome significantly. Um, so we make sure that we understand what's happening here and why we have the cellular milieu that we've chosen and how to best prepare the, the, uh, the patient because concentration is, is uh, important but really the regenerative potential uh, depends upon growth factors and, uh, and you know, quantity as well as, as activity. So this is what's really important. At the, the Toby conference in 2015, there was a lot of chatter about platelet-rich plasma. You see positive studies on the left side, you see negative studies on the right side, and, and the question is, you know, what's going on here? And so as a result, there's really a, um, a call for this standard, not only classification system, so that we can better understand what PRP is uh, working for you know the appropriate application but also just to kind of rein this in a little bit we've we've got the wild west out there with everybody spinning a different type of plate the rich plasma some i'll show you in a minute very well known systems have even less platelets in the platelet rich plasma as they do in baseline so it's 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 certainly not concentrated it's actually less than what, uh, what we see. So uh, again, really important that we have some standards and we have some definitions. I love this slide because it shows, again, the results. So look just on your far right, significant difference, significant difference, all the way down until you see no difference and then more pain and swelling. Um, and then if you look at the PRP formulation, what I have been suspecting all along is that we need four to six times concentration we need very low granulocytes. We need a very high monocyte yield. And we need robust um, uh, growth factors. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So a leukocyte poor, red blood cell poor, I didn't mention that. We, we really aren't, don't want the red blood cells in there either because they can, can cause some irritation. Um, some uh, physicians have stated that they feel there's quite a bit more more pain and swelling when you have red blood cells. And certainly this table would support that. So a, a leukocyte poor, red blood cell poor, monocyte rich, in, in my opinion, is going to give us a cons more consistent significant difference. So it's starting to shake out. It really is starting to shake out. And this is where it starts getting exciting. So we've already established that not all PRP is created equal. It is important that we understand the different isolation and concentration techniques that are going to impact the growth factors. It's important that we understand um, who our patient is and, and we properly prepare them. I use the M-Site system. Um, there are many different 
uh, PRP devices that, M well, there's a couple of different PRP devices that MSite offers. There's also bone marrow stem cell devices as well as um, fat grafting devices, and you'll find that in the handout. Uh, PRP Science Catalog really details all of those things. But I like the pure PRP2 system because what this allows me to do is spin whatever kind of PRP I want. So no matter how the 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 um, uh, studies shake out, no matter what comes up in the literature as the best platelet-rich plasma, I have the flexibility with this system to spin it that way. So there's adjustments in centrifuge speed, if you will, there's adjustments in how we harvest the PRP, and yet it's a very, very simple system where you make subtle changes in your process, which you know takes less than 10 minutes, and voila, you have a very low inflammatory PRP, which is what I typically spin with high platelet counts, low granulocytes, high monocytes, low red blood cells, or you know I can have a very high granulocyte concentration and, and even pull some of the red blood cells in there should I choose. You can see a single spin tube system um, very easily can create this buffy coat. What's challenging about this is you know, you're picking up all, you don't really have a consistent harvesting of platelet-rich plasma when you spin this way. You can make a buffy coat, but now you're taking inflammatory as well as anti-inflammatory white blood cells. You don't know how much to concentrate the platelets, how much platelet-poor plasma to take off. It's just, it's kind of sloppy, if you will. It's not consistent. All right, and you have no control over it. This just further details a single spin system. And, and really quite frequently, most of the platelets aren't even harvested in this type of system. And certainly at best, it's inconsistent. I pulled up just right off the websites on some common um, uh, companies here. And I just did this today, just thinking, you know, I should, I should really show you. So I don't, I don't have them all, but Eclipse is one that I know um, many of my colleagues are using. And if we look at, at the Eclipse website and we look at what's, what's being said here, it basically we draw 11 cc's of whole blood into a, a glass tube and we spin it for a few minutes. I think it's, I think it's eight minutes. And uh, the chart here on the right shows that we have an increase in platelet concentration by two and a half fold. Well, now I want you to think about that. That is absolutely impossible, really. If, if you look down here in the best value, um, about halfway down on the left side, we're, getting, we're claiming to get six milliliters of platelet-rich plasma per 11 milliliters of whole blood. Well, if I took 11 milliliters of whole blood and I took every single platelet and I concentrated it into the plasma and took off all the red blood cells, I can't two and a half times baseline. I can't even have two times baseline. So I have less than two times baseline concentration. And that's if I get, if I have a 100% yield of platelets, which we don't. No system's going to have 100% recovery. We're seeing here on the top of the features and benefits that there's 90% optimal platelet recovery. Though I haven't seen any true validation, um, I'll believe them. Okay, I think a third party validation is very important, but I'm going to believe them that there's 90% platelet recovery. That still can't possibly give me two and a half times the concentration. I would have to take some platelet poor plasma off. What I find interesting is that most physicians, even physicians that are currently spinning PRP, don't really understand some of these details. And it's certainly not a criticism. It's taken me quite a while to figure this all out. But that's where the education, I think, is going to help you make a better choice um, for your practice and for your patient, ultimately. And, and just an educated choice, that's all. I want you to understand what you're, you're spinning and why it is you're using what you're using so that you can predict some of your outcomes. So here's Regent Lab. I like Regent Lab. I, it, it's a validated system, which uh, I respect wholeheartedly. And what their validated system is telling us is that it's 1.6 times baseline. I believe that's accurate. If I do the math, it makes sense. If I take 10 mLs of whole blood and, I, and I'm able to get um, uh, 5 mLs of platelet-rich plasma, it certainly is reasonable to think that I'm going to have a 1.6 times baseline concentration. The problem is, 
that doesn't fit my scientific definition of platelet-rich plasma. I know that that does not create an angiogenesis for me. I know that that's true. I also know that I don't get mesenchymal stem cell migration to the area when I am using anything less than that, that um, uh, uh, 1.5 million platelets. So again, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I have yet to see a study. I, I see here at the bottom here, it says some studies even showed that too high a platelet concentration may actually have negative effects. I haven't seen that study. I haven't seen any of those studies. So I'm not really sure what's happening there. And again, you know, will we see some collagen change with region labs? Absolutely. Can, can, can we hurt somebody with the region lab PRP? Absolutely not. So there's no harm being done here, except I think that it's time for us to grow this up, and I think it's time for us to really talk about effectiveness and best patient outcome so that we can move this thing forward. Um, there are no white blood cells in the Regent lab, which, which I guess is good, so we don't have a strong inflammatory response but we also don't have a strong anti-inflammatory response. So you can see at the bottom here, few white blood cells are still present. Most of them are mononuclear cells or monocytes. That's a good thing. The problem is there's very few, okay? And I really want an anti-inflammatory platelet-rich plasma when I, when I spin. So this is another very well-known system, the Harvest system. Many of you might have the Harvest system. Again, a very, very good system very good professional system. You can certainly get your platelet concentration within the sweet spot, absolutely. What I don't like about this system is I don't have the control that I want. I don't have the control over um, spinning a PRP with low granulocyte and high monocyte count. I basically have what I have. I can concentrate the plasma a little bit further if I want to take off some additional platelet poor plasma, so that's kind of nice, but it doesn't get me what I need um, for flexibility, and it certainly won't serve my purposes as you know things shake out in the literature. Same is true with the with the Magellan system or the True PRP platform. It's a it's a beautiful centrifuge. You can dial in uh, platelet concentration absolutely, but you have no control over how many red blood cells. You have no control over um, whether you have high granulocytes or monocytes. I can tell you that the validation data, which I'll refer to in a moment, shows that you actually have um, quite a few granulocytes and, uh, and, and you don't have a real robust yield of monocytes. So again, the m site system is very flexible and that's, that's what um, I'm looking for. It's a very, very easy to use system and um, you can see here it's, it's completely closed. There is a self-sealing port, so there's, there's, it's very, very safe. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, simple design really, I think, that, uh, that lends itself to the precision that we're looking for. I'm able to take uh, either 30 mLs, 60 mLs, or even 120 mLs of whole blood and spin it down. I can have a super concentrated PRP if I want, which I don't typically want. I can have lots of volume of a four to six times baseline concentration. In fact, what I typically do is I'll take 60 mLs of my anticoagulated whole blood and I'll spin it in the two-step process, one and a half minutes to separate out the red blood cells and the granulocytes, and then I pull the platelet suspension off, which has all my platelets, my bioactive proteins, and my monocytes, and then I concentrate it further, spin it for five minutes, and I have um, the uh, four to six times baseline that I'm looking for. So lots of flexibility. I spin the protocol A, which allows me to have um, very few, if any, red blood cells. I have total control over that. And again, everything is um, uh, it's closed system. Everything that you need is in the actual kit. So your, your anticoagulant is there. Sodium citrate is the anticoagulant that we use with this m -site system. You can certainly use a, a um, dextrose solution if you'd like. Um, your blood draw kit is in there, several different syringes. Everything that I need for my assistant to create my 10 mLs of, of a four to six times baseline concentration of PRP is in there. All right, I won't belabor the point. Um, m -Site has also done a great job. They've been in the business for 17 plus years, so they're not newcomers by any means, but they've, they've gone through the financial 
and academic pains of uh, having some validation done by an independent third party, which is Dr. Mandel up at, at Harvard. So they, they did a study in 2014 looking at the M-Site system and the ANGEL system and M-Site fared very, very well in my mind with the cellular components that I'm looking for. Then again in 2015 looking at um, the pure PRP system versus the harvest and the, the ANGEL system again. And we can see here, this is the summarized results of that 2015 study where we have our 6.6 .6 times concentration, um, we have a nice platelet yield, lots of deliverable platelets, very low granulocyte, very high monocyte, and that's what I'm looking for. It's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, there was a most recent study that was published um, 2016, so May 6th, looking at, again, M-site pure PRP versus Magellan versus Regent and Eclipse, and there's some very interesting findings here. And Magellan actually did pretty well, and, and I knew that it would because it's, it's quite a good system. It, 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 didn't, um, it didn't deliver what exactly I'm looking for in terms of low granulocyte count, uh, but it was a nice monocyte yield and a very nice platelet yield. Okay, but pure PRP, the M-site system certainly uh, came up on top. Now here's what I found really surprising. The region system and the eclipse system both had less platelets in the PRP than they did at baseline. I was a bit surprised about the region system. I wasn't surprised about the eclipse system. I, I haven't been really impressed with that, uh, but there it was. And this was an independent third party study. So less platelets, very, very low yield, obviously, um, very few granulocytes, very few monocytes. There were no granulocytes or monocytes in the Eclipse system, and, and uh, as Regent claimed, there were some white blood cells left and they were monocytes. But just, you know, nothing there is, is really going to help us uh, achieve the angiogenesis and certainly not the mesenchymal stem cell migration. Okay, and anybody who's interested in those validation studies, I'm sure that Jill with PRP Science, actually they're on the prpscience.org website, so you can go right there and take a look for yourself. And what you'll see is the M-Site system also had the highest concentration of deliverable uh, platelets and growth factors. So remember we were talking about platelet concentration being being part of the process, obviously the most important first important first step of the process, but that there had to be uh, growth factors that were expressed once the platelet-rich plasma was activated and the M-site system fared very, very well. Um, we, we had a consistent high concentration of monocytes, which is what I like for that long-term non-anti-inflammatory uh, process and also uh, the support that's necessary if you're dealing with active wounds and just general repair. 99% of the red blood cells were removed, which is also important to me when I'm doing, uh, when I'm treating a woman, for instance, with lichen sclerosis. That's an inflammatory process. And boy, I don't want to add any kind of irritant, which the red blood cells have the potential for that. Um, uh, and I don't want to add any inflammation. So I don't want to have the granulocytes. I get great results with my M-site system with lichen sclerosis. Uh, Dr. Goldstein spun the Magellan system when he did the study and he, he found that he got good results. I get great results and I'm going to try to um, um, sway him to use, if I can, and for lack of a better word, sway him to use the M-site system so that we can, we can see what this anti-inflammatory PRP uh, will really lend to the disease uh, the resolution of the disease process, lichen sclerosis. Uh, I've had some serious cases of lichen sclerosis in my practice, and we have just gotten amazing results using this pure pure. P All right. So just a quick comparison. I didn't say anything about Dr. PRP, and yes, PRP, um, and and I should have really put a slide in there. I, I wasn't wasn't thinking until.
before we started, uh, but I can give you the rundown. I've used both of them. Uh, when you look at the design, it looks like a decent design. It looks like you could spin it and have some flexibility. It really does. What I found, and, and here's why I switch. What, what I do is I move, I buy these systems, I use them, I do CBCs, I, I analyze them myself, I look at anecdotally at the results clinically that I'm getting, and then I move if it's not exactly what I'm looking for. And so I've, I've owned all of these systems. And in fact, I've got some centrifuges in my closet that uh, I'd like to move on if anyone's interested. But the Dr. PRP and the SPRP kits, I have not found to be very beneficial. And there's a couple of reasons. Number one, neither one of them are validated. I did my own validation. Um, the SPRP is not FDA cleared. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the FDA, but I think that when we're in this space and there are FDA approved pieces of equipment, we should at the very least be using the, those systems in case there's any problems. We don't have a question about, uh, about that validity. But I found that the platelet yield is very inconsistent. There were times when I got a real nice platelet yield. And then there were times when I had less platelets than I did at baseline. And it was surprising. When I was spinning these two systems, you could actually see, you actually make a buffy coat with these two systems, which automatically disqualifies them in my mind for what I'm looking for, because I can't easily separate out the monocytes and the granulocytes and, and leave behind red blood cells. So I know now that that's not what I'm looking for. But when I was using them, I could see the Buffy code. It was really beautiful. And then as I tried to harvest the PRP out of the device itself, I could see that it was getting stuck to the sides. And if any of you are spinning these two types of systems, you may have noticed as well. There's this cloudy layer that's in there, and you can't seem to get it out. Well, guess what? Those are the platelets. And I know they're the platelets because I did the CBCs. And if you do the CBCs, you'll know that as well. Um, I, there was, there is a, uh, Dr. Bauman is a hair restoration specialist, great guy, great scientist, and um, I, I shared this with him. He saw exactly what I was talking about. He bought a cell counter. He's doing cell counts on his platelet-rich plasma, does a ton of platelet-rich plasma procedures. He saw exactly what I was seeing, and that is very inconsistent platelet yield, very low platelet yield quite frequently. And, um, and he's now using the M-Site system. And actually, just today, for the first time, he injected, he's trying, he's saying, okay, Beth, um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the M-Site system provides us with a much better platelet-rich plasma and much more consistent, but what does it mean clinically? Great question. It's the million-dollar question. It's what I hope that we're going to answer next. Okay, and, and, I, and I really asked him to please do these kind of studies and please at least use a system where there's consistent yield and, and uh, consistent cellular components so that when we look at this thing clinically as the orthopedic surgeons have, yeah, we know what we're doing. Much, much of the time these studies are done and there isn't a whole lot of detail to what is actually in the PRP that's being applied clinically. So Dr. Bauman, I am so proud of him and I'm so excited to be part of this, is, is actually doing cell counts on all baseline as well as the platelet-rich plasma sample. Then he goes ahead and injects the patient and uh, he injected um, a uh, patient today where half the head with the SPRP, half the head with the m -Site system. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I actually think that uh, the quality of the platelet-rich plasma from the m -Site system is, is going to bring up the result that he gets on the other side with the SPRP system just by the nature of this powerful mitogenic activity for mesenchymal stem cells that occurs with this type of platelet-rich plasma. Uh, but we'll see. You know, we'll see. I'm, I'm excited to see because guess what? I'm going to use what comes up on top. And that's my commitment to my patients, and that's the commitment to the physicians that I train as well. If I find that any one of these systems has a better clinical response, that's where I'm going. So right now, I use m for that reason. All right. Uh, we have a training program where, where uh, there are several physicians that are using the m system that are training doctors to use platelet-rich plasma. Um, a, a few of those locations, myself included, we're training to do the vampire procedures, the O-shot, the priapus shot, 
Um, and so we're very excited about that. You can visit Studio PRP, go to training, and you'll see a couple of different locations. And those physicians are using the MSITE system, so you'll actually experience that there. There's contact information for Jill um, at, at PRP Science. That's the distributor for this. And um, I'm going to answer a couple of questions. And if any of you have questions, then you're certainly welcome to ask. All right. So the first question is, is calcium still recommended for the priapus shot, the O shot, and the facial? Well, I use calcium chloride to activate my platelet-rich plasma when I'm doing a priapus shot and an O shot. So whenever I'm injecting platelet-rich plasma into um, uh, Really, whenever I'm injecting, is if I'm injecting into an injured knee, for instance, an injured joint, my feeling is there's a, a process already in play. When I introduce the platelet-rich plasma to that process, it's automatically going to activate. But when I'm putting platelet-rich plasma in the periurethral space or a, uh, the glands penis, and, and I'm trying to stimulate a regeneration, I'm going to activate first and I'm going to activate just before I inject. And that way I know that if I've properly prepared my patient, they're not taking NSAIDs, they haven't had any systemic steroids, um, then I'm going to get a degranulation and spilling those growth factors into the area. When I do a facial, which is, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the vampire facial, which is a microneedling uh, um, with a topically applied platelet-rich plasma, you, you, I don't activate. And I don't activate because I'm creating a dermal wound with the microneedling. Or if, you know, some people will say that the vampire facial, they're doing intradermal injections. Either way, microneedling with topical PRP is the classical definition. I've already got a wound in process, so there's plenty of calcium in that area. I don't want to create a PRP gel matrix with, with by activating. I really want to drip the serum onto the skin and allow it to, to wick in. And the way I talk about this to my patients is that, you know, we create the dermal wound and then we're dropping behind some fertilizer to really, to really help with um, maximum regeneration. And, and it's amazing. And people absolutely love these procedures because they work and, um, and so it's a lot of fun. All right, next question. Is anyone using autologous fat for the priapus shot vampire facelift versus fillers. Um, I'm not, and, and I imagine there might be people who are. I believe that Dr. Runnels really does not want the priapus shot to be associated with fat. It's truly a technique um, using platelet-rich plasma, and as well as the vampire facelift is a combination of, of uh, a dermal filler, typically hyaluronic acid, with injected platelet-rich plasma. Now there's lots of ways of doing this and you can certainly put your own spin on it. I have not found the need to use fat or adipose derived stem cells for um, my priapus shots or vampire facelifts, um, but you certainly can and I'm sure people are doing it. I've had all the training but I just haven't found the need, I haven't been compelled to, um, uh, to go there. All right, next question is, are you seeing a more dramatic response rate with the O-Shot and the Priapus shot since switching to the M-Site kits? You know, I would say yes, and I realize that that is anecdotal, and that's the best answer I can give you. If I wasn't, I would be looking for something else, and I'm always still looking. You know, I'm always looking at the literature, and I, and I want to dial it in. Uh, but yes, I am, and I'm very, very happy to, to um, have found the M-Site system. The company's been great to work with, and it's it's just been a joy to participate at this particular level. All right, next question. In particular, the priapus shot. Since we perform more of these, and it seems to have a lower response rate. Oh, that was referring to the M-Site kit. You know, I actually have good results with my priapus shots. I really do. Now, it's important um, that that you understand that the pump, the 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 vacuum erection device, and and PRP Science sells a very, very nice one. My patients absolutely love it. Um, the vacuum erection device is an important part of this whole regenerative process when it comes to erectile function. And then also when it comes to the priapus, I mean to the uh, peronis. Um, you, you have to, 
you have to really help to continually activate the regenerative process by using the vacuum pump and to encourage, as Dr. Bano explains to me, you, know, you really need to encourage blood flow to that tissue. If you have a guy with erectile dysfunction, um, you know, the penis will atrophy, the tissues aren't getting full blood supply. And so platelet-rich plasma will, will help to bring, the right kind of platelet-rich plasma, will help to bring some stem cells to the area, you'll create this angiogenesis. But really, the vacuum erection device will draw that blood into those distal tissues and help to revive and regenerate. Dr. Bano has a great, great story uh, about a patient who had a penile implant placed, um, and he does a lot of these very successfully, but the, this, this implant eroded. And, uh, you know, you can imagine that's a, that's, a real, that's a real serious complication, and this is not something that's uncommon across the, the penile world. Uh, so Dr. Bano was able to remove the implant and after three priapus shots, now this is amazing, this guy needed an implant because he had severe erectile dysfunction. After three priapus shots and using the vac vacuum erection device, um, uh, he, this, this guy has had an amazing response. Now if I'm remembering the story correctly, he was using the vacuum erection device with a daily Cialis after the penile implant was removed and he really wasn't getting very far with this. Dr. Bano then said, look, you know, let's, let's put some PRP in there. Dr. Bano was relatively new to PRP at the time and wow, started to see a response after the first injection, went ahead and did a second one and then consequently a third one. One thing that I see consistently is that if we have a guy who, who used to be a responder to the PDE5 inhibitors and who no longer is a responder to the PDE5 inhibitors, you go ahead and do a priapus shot and within the next couple of weeks he's responding again and you want to talk about thrilled. In my mind that's a huge success and I see that all the time um, and certainly I see that all the time using the M-Site system. We see an improvement in the sensitivity as well, which makes for better erection. So I, I do, I, re I really appreciate this particular question. It is anecdotal. I do see a better response. It makes sense when you look at the science why, and I see a, a consistent response. That being said, all men are different. Also that being said, you know, PRP is a tool in my practice. It's not the end all be all. I'm optimizing hormones, I'm using the medications and the other devices, as I mentioned, the vacuum erection device um, in conjunction with these. So I actually get pretty good results. Um, and you know, it's getting, getting exciting treating more Peronis patients as well. All right, I've got another question here. I did an O-shot on a lady who had two sling procedures that failed. The O-shot worked well for three weeks and then she started urinating again. What happened? Is this an explanation? Is there an explanation for this failure? What do I do? Okay, so I, I don't know anything about this patient and I'm assuming that it's a stress incontinence since she had a sling. I'm also assuming that it's a stress incontinence since placing the platelet-rich plasma the way he did um, when you do the O-shot created likely a bulking type of effect. That bulking type of effect in this particular case only lasted three weeks. Well, here's what is, is again, missing is, is some of this education. You, you, you need to use all of the tools available. I use a device called the Apex-M and that's also available through, through uh, PRP Science. Apex-M is an electro-stim device. It is a pelvic rehab device. It's simple to use. I include it in the price of my O-Shot. Every single woman that comes in for an O-Shot gets either an intensity or an Apex M. If um, her primary issue or if it, there's an issue of urinary incontinence, I use the Apex M. It is the missing piece. So for any of you who are doing O-Shots, please do your patient the service of adding the, the device, medical device, see Jill for that. It's simple, it's easy. Women will use this device and what it does is it strengthens the pelvic bowl muscles, it stimulates the skein's glands for lubrication, it stimulates blood flow to the area. When you stimulate the blood flow and contraction of those muscles, you're removing toxins, you're bringing oxygen to the area, all good things happen. It also will help to contribute um, to collagen stimulation. So you'll have a thickening of that anterior vaginal wall in addition to the musculature. So you won't have just a temporary bulking that occurs. You'll have a total resolution. 
total resolution. And I, and I will add this, that the, the O-shot is amazing for women who have an urge incontinence for which there's very little help. It is amazing and it will work in the first couple of weeks. So I'm assuming this was a stress incontinence and if you added the Apex M, you would certainly have a much longer duration success. What I do is I, I ask my patients to come in for an annual procedure. So once we've solved their problem, sometimes it's more than one procedure, one injection, like in the case of um, Dr. Bano's gentleman with, with um, the uh, eroded penile implant, it took three. Once we reach the goal, then we come in annually. And that way we can continue this regenerative process and we can continue even seeing benefits. Um, a lot of my patients now are coming in for their fourth or fifth annual injection and they say they haven't had any regression. They still continue to have great results, but they want to keep that up and it makes sense to them that you have to continue to, to do um, you know, some regenerative techniques. All right, can you discuss the data or any studies showing effect of the priapus shot specifically? Uh, sadly to say, there are none. There, there, there is absolutely uh, nothing written on the priapus shot on humans. We do have some rat studies that actually show regeneration and a neuroangiogenesis that occurs post-simulated uh, radical prostatectomy, so that's very promising. Dr. Bano, Dr. Perito, are uh, pulling together a, a um, uh, retrospective study that we hope to be presenting at the uh, SMSNA or the AUA this year. Um, there is a prospective study that's, that's in the works as well. We're pending IRB approval. Dr. Darius Paduk at Weill Cornell, uh, we are days away from getting an IRB approval for the Priapus shot. So, you know, it's, it's tricky. I know Dr. Runnels is working on some software that will allow us to all participate in a survey type of a, of a study and that will be FDA approved and, uh, or, I'm sorry, IRB approved. Hopefully he'll be out with that in the next weeks. So we're, we're in that crazy place where all of this is anecdotal. All right, do we ever use autologous thrombin to activate. I don't, I never do. Um, there is some data on that that shows in fact that the, the, um, active, the uh, thrombus is not as good to activate as the calcium. And there's another uh, substance, I'm not remembering exactly what it is. But no, I've never used the thrombin. There is some reactive, allergic reactive potential with the thrombin apparently. And uh, it's, I don't know that it's as readily available. All right, so how long to stop NSAIDs before and how long after a procedure? I typically will say five to seven days before and five to seven days after. Uh, sadly, the, the, um, the study that I pointed to actually didn't give us uh, a time frame, but I will have my patients stop you know, fish oils, any systemic steroids and NSAIDs for five to seven days beforehand. Where's the best place to get calcium chloride? The pharmacies say you can only use it once due to, to, to no preservatives. Um, I actually get my calcium chloride from Master Farm. Um, you can find them online. Master Farm is a, is a great compounding pharmacy out of New York. They make a lot of, of uh, adjunctive solutions for me that I use with Play the Rich Plasma. For instance, when I do a studio scalp, which is the, for hair stimulation, I mix niacin and dexapanthenol and a, and a vitamin D oil um, as, as well as the calcium chloride and they make all that for us. You can get the calcium chloride in a 1 ml or even a 5 ml if you keep it frozen until you're ready to use it. It lasts a long time. So anyway, Master Farm is one good place to get it. Uh, do you have any persistent non-responders? If so, any idea why? I have not had any persistent non-responders. No, I can honestly say, as I think through my data bank here, no persistent non-responders. And again, you know, I'm using PRP as a tool. It's not my. It's not the only thing that I'll do. And I'm going for fabulous results. I'm going for you know, the resolution of the patient's problem. So I find a way typically. And we've done some really amazing things with platelet-rich plasma. Uh, I've had men with ejaculatory pain for decades, decades of ejaculatory pain, 
inject plate the rich plasma into the perineum or you know, the pelvic bowl, and we have a complete resolution of this ejaculation. Dr. Perito, who is um, a very well-known urologist in Miami, came to my training and was floored by some of the patients that came through that were telling the trainees, the physician trainees, their experience. I mean, it was, I, I didn't even plan it that way, but it really couldn't have been better because he was telling me how, how he, he, he just shudders at the thought of seeing a patient with this ejaculatory pain since there's so little to do. So lots of exciting things. Uh, you know, with platelet-rich plasma so far in my practice. All right, how long to wait between repeat private shot injections? You know, I say eight to 12 weeks is typically what I'll do. All right, um, and I, I use uh, a pharma compounding pharmacy called Wells Pharmacy I'll, uh, quite frequently, and I use Master Farm for, for a lot of things, but Wells Pharmacy has some unique compounds. One is an oxytocin uh, to dalafil combination and so I'll, I, you know, I want to encourage blood flow. Um, Jill with PRP Science also offers um, a supplement called Edox, which is a proprietary formula of some nitric oxide producing type substances, and that actually has been found to uh, work as well as a daily five milligram Cialis, which you can also use. So I'm going to inject a priapus shot. I'm going to typically put them on 60 days of Cialis, five milligrams, or maybe an oxytocin to dalafil combination. I'm going to have them use the vacuum erection device every single day, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night at minimum. Um, I'm going to talk to him in about four weeks. I'm going to see what, what's going on, if he is doing well. Uh, if he's not, we're going to think a little bit more. I might check his hormones at that particular point um, and, and, and just take it from there. But I, I guess, you know, if he's really not doing well at that four week, I, I will call him back at eight weeks and we'll talk about doing a second procedure at that time. I have a gentleman right now that I'm helping who's seven years post prostatectomy and boy, he's thrilled. He's absolutely thrilled because he has sensitivity back. He's having erections. Um, I just optimized his hormones so his, his sexual function actually improves significantly once I reversed this high estradiol, low testosterone problem that he was having. He's using his vacuum erection device. He comes to me from Texas to, for, uh, to Florida and I just did his second procedure yesterday, um, but he's he's thrilled. And I injected a little PRP in the perineum because it made sense to me. We want to try to nourish that area, especially post prostatectomy. How do you handle questions from patients asking about PRP devices and kits being FDA cleared for orthopedic uses and not the O and the P shot? Uh, that one's a really simple one for me. I let them know that the device that I'm using has been cleared to produce platelet-rich plasma so that we know that it meets the sterility um, uh, regulations, we know that the FDA has touched it and they have blessed it to create platelet-rich plasma. I also let them know that the FDA is probably never going to clear these devices for, for use for the O shot and the priapus shot because it's out of their jurisdiction, they don't have to. As the treating physician, I get to decide how I want to use this platelet-rich plasma. So, you know, it's, it's off-label, if you will. Um, it, that seems to satisfy people. I've never had anyone have any problem uh, with that type of a response. So the devices I use, and that speaks to the SPRP device that I'd mentioned earlier that is not FDA cleared, um, I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it for that reason. You know, we've got to um, at least stay within the rules that, that have been established, uh, but the FDA does not, not decide how I use the platelet-rich plasma. It's just not part of the jurisdiction. You know, if we don't clean this thing up and we don't actually develop some of these standards and we don't um, be a bit more responsible with how we market these procedures and how we, we treat the patient, then, you know, we could very well see some FDA involvement like we're seeing in the stem cell realm. All right, you can use calcium chloride or calcium gluconate to activate, and that's absolutely correct. Um, calcium gluconate I found easier to get than calcium chloride for a while, and it didn't have to be refrigerated, and there were some preservatives in there, but then I found it difficult to get. So now I find calcium chloride easy to get, uh, but either one, and I, I don't see the difference in them, so whatever is easy for you. Are you using a cell with PRP for hair or no need at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not. 
I was, and I was using a cell when I wasn't using as robust a PRP. You know, we talk about needing a scaffolding, and we want to try to throw as much at it as possible to get our result. Now that I'm using the uh, the the M site system, and I'm getting such a robust plate the rich plasma, I I don't use a, a cell. And in fact, I wonder if there's even some inhibitory potential. Um, I think that you know. Uh, I just haven't seemed to have the need, and I get really nice results. I really do. I know that Dr. Uh, Bauman is using BioD, and we had that conversation about needing a scaffolding. He was spinning SPRP when he did his tests. Um, you know, at least at least 30% of the time he was getting less platelet yield than baseline. So yeah, I mean, you're going to need a scaffolding in that particular point. You're going to need something because you're not going to get that robust regenerative response. Uh, but I, I don't find the need at this particular time. It's a great question. What's my protocol for a hair treatment? Some do four PRP treatments, some do one with A-cell and then wait six months and do another. Uh, I don't really have a standard protocol. Everybody seems to be a little different. Women are much easier to fix than men. I find that women respond pretty consistently after one treatment and then I'll go ahead and I have them come back at four weeks even if I don't you know, see much happening. I, I want to keep in close contact with my patient because, you know, I might put her on something called 82M, which is a minoxidil retinoic acid with some herbs. Um, Dr. Bauman is, is participating in a study right now where he's actually formulated something called 82F, um, which is, has some finasteride with some herbs as well. And so I want to add something that's going to, again, help to, to stimulate some hair growth. I want to stimulate the stem cell and bring it out of its dormant phase with my platelet-rich plasma. If, if you're doing injections with platelet-rich plasma on the scalp and you're not doing microneedling, well, there can be a very big difference there. I see a very big difference when, when we have uh, doctors who are not doing the microneedling. It's a really important part of the process, in my opinion, in my opinion. So typically, I would see my patient back in about four weeks. And, and, and then I may schedule another one at a 12-week mark, uh, depending upon what we're seeing. But I'm also using LaserCap Pro, um, and PRP Science has that available for you as well. That is a very, very good um, low-level light therapy device. Dr. Bauman introduced me to that device, and um, my patients really like that device. And what I typically do, I have one in the office for a demo. I will um, do my Play the Rich Plasma treatment. I mix, as I mentioned, niacin, dexapanthenol, uh, vitamin D with, uh, with my Play the Rich Plasma. And, and after that, I'll go ahead and put some saran wrap over the, the top and I'll place my laser cap over it and just, you know, 10 minutes with the laser cap on while I clean up and give them some post procedure instructions. Um, I like to do that, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that it adds benefit, um, but I do know that that laser cap works very well. So I, I try not to just keep doing one procedure after the next. I'm a functional medicine physician. I try to figure out why they're losing hair. I will help them clean, their, clean up their gut. I'll help them balance their hormones and nutritionally be more competent. Okay. And I th think that's it. Um, yeah, the topical drops that I do use if I'm using are 82M, and I'm really anxious for the 82F to come out as well. But I've had patients who are on those products, and yeah, they got some good hair growth, they did, but it wasn't until I did the PRP that we then catapulted into the next dimension as far as uh, benefit is concerned. You know, the quality of the hair changes, and um, um, it just it makes all the difference in the world. It really does. Uh, I'm going to answer this one last question. You use multiple modalities for treatment. Did you use these prior and now begin adding PRP? Can you compare the benefits by adding PRP versus simply using the other modalities? The answer is yes. In most cases, I've used the other modalities. Just as I was mentioning with men who, um, you know, using PDE5 inhibitors, they're plugging along, and now their PDE5 inhibitors don't work. You introduce the vacuum device. Okay, well, that might help a little bit, you know, but their PDE5 inhibitors are still not working. 
you inject platelet-rich plasma, and so far, I know Dr. Bano and, and I have had the same experience, we've talked about this at length, so far, 100% of the men that we have injected who were non-responders, who are now responders, are res um, who were responders, then now non-responders, sorry, are now responding after play the rich plasma. So, I mean, that's powerful stuff. Same thing with women. You know, we've used some pelvic exercisers. I used to use the Kegel Master 2000, which could work. Certainly with a stress incontinence, you could see an improvement in the muscular component. But there wasn't anything that I found that really worked with an urge incontinence. And you put PRP in there, and within a couple of weeks, there's a full resolution. You know, I've got a testimonial from a patient on my doctorstudio.com website where I have a 13-year post-breast cancer patient come to me. She came to me for sexual dysfunction. She had such horrible vaginal dryness and pain with intercourse that she couldn't stand it. I learned later that on her drive from Miami to Boca Raton, she stopped to pee more than a dozen times, and her family didn't even want to go anywhere with her because this problem was, was so you know, horrible all the time. And this had been going on for years and years. Well, you'll see on this testimonial, four weeks after one O shot, four weeks after, she's having sex without pain, and she didn't stop to pee even once on her way from Miami to Boca Raton. That was a completely unexpected response. Um, she wasn't even considering it for urinary incontinence. Huge. I now take care of her and her husband. Uh, and, and I added a little estriol vaginal uh, insert because, um, uh, you know, I just, you have to feed the tissue the raw material. You can stimulate regeneration, but you've got to feed the tissue the raw material. She was post breast cancer, so I felt perfectly safe giving her the uh, estriol, and that PRP was it's just a, a lifesaver. I've started women on the estriol, and they, we didn't really get to the goal until we added the PRP. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, aesthetically, I see it's a total game changer. I've been injecting Botox and fillers for years. Uh, my patients have all been very happy. When we add the plate, the rich plasma, the game changes. The, the skin changes. There's a beautiful, youthful glow. There's a change in the color. And, and they don't want fillers without it anymore. Um, it's just, you know, I, I can't say enough about how uh, Play the Rich Plasma has changed my practice. Um, uh, Dr. Runnels really helped me to understand um, how to help some of these patients with, with the uh, techniques that he's developed. And then we have certainly have improved upon them, and we develop our own styles as we move through these things. And I'm excited to, to have um, information from some of the specialists that I'm working with. Dr. Rapole in Lafayette, Colorado has some really great techniques for helping men and women with, with plate the rich plasma applied to the pelvic bowl in a prolotherapy type of a technique. So all kinds of fun things happening. But thank you again for joining us. I really, really appreciate it and um, happy to take any questions that anyone has. Um, I put the emails back up. You'll see the order forms, the informations uh, for Jill and um, have a great evening.